Chapter Eight of Herman and Dorothea by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, translated by Ellen Frothingham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone. Melpomene, Herman and Dorothea. Towards the setting sun, the two thus went on their journey. Close he had wrapped himself round with clouds, pretending a tempest. Out from the vale, now here and now there, with fiery flashes gleaming over the field shot forth the ominous lightning may not these threatening heavens said herman be presently sending hailstones upon us and violent rains for fair is the harvest and in the waving luxuriant grain they delighted together almost as high it reached as the lofty shapes that moved through it thereupon spoke the maiden and said to her guide and companion friend unto whom i soon am to owe so kindly a fortune shelter and home while many in exiles exposed to the tempest tell me concerning thy parents i pray thee and teach me to know them tell whom with all my heart i desire to serve in the future who understands his master more easily gives satisfaction having regard to the things which to him seem chief in importance and on the doing of which his firm-set mind is determined tell me therefore i pray how to win thy father and mother and to her question made answer the good and intelligent herman ah what wisdom thou showest thou good thou excellent maiden asking thus first of all concerning the tastes of my parents know that in vain hitherto i have laboured in serving my father taking upon me as were it my own the charge of the household early and late at work in the fields and o'erseeing the vineyard but my mother i fully content who can value my service and thou wilt also appear in her eyes the worthiest of maidens if for the house thou carest as were it thine own thou wast keeping otherwise it is with father who cares for the outward appearance do not regard me good maiden as one who is cold and unfeeling that unto thee a stranger i straightway discover my father nay i assure thee that never before have words such as these are freely dropped from my tongue which is not accustomed to prattle but from out of my bosom thou lurest its every secret some of the graces of life my good father covets about him outward signs of affection he wishes as well as of honour and an inferior servant might possibly give satisfaction who could turn these to account while he might be displeased with a better thereupon said she with joy the while her hastening footsteps over the darkening pathway with easy motions she quickened truly i hope to them both i shall equally give satisfaction for in thy mother's nature i find such a one as mine own is and to the outward graces i have been from my childhood accustomed greatly was courtesy valued among our neighbours the frenchmen during their earlier days it was common to noble and burgher as to the peasant and every one made it the rule of his household so on the side of us germans the children were likewise accustomed daily to bring to their parents with kissing of hands and with curtsies morning good wishes and all through the day to be prettily mannered everything thus that i learned and to which i have been used from my childhood all that my heart shall suggest shall be brought into play for thy father but who shall tell me of thee and how thyself shouldst be treated thou the only son of the house and henceforth my master thus she said and e'en as she spoke they stood under the pear tree down from the heavens the moon at her full was shedding her splendour night had come on and wholly obscured was the last gleam of sunlight so that contrasting masses lay side by side with each other clear and bright as the day and black with the shadows of midnight gratefully fell upon herman's ear the kindly asked question under the shade of the glorious tree the spot he so treasured which but this morning had witnessed the tears he had shed for the exile and while they set themselves down to rest him here for a little thus spoke the amorous youth as he grasped the hand of the maiden suffer thy heart to make answer and follow it freely in all things yet not further he ventured to say although so propitious seemed the hour he feared he should only haste on a refusal ah and he felt besides the ring on her finger sad token 
therefore they sat there silent and still beside one another first was the maiden to speak how sweet is this glorious moonlight said she at length it is as the light of the day in its brightness there in the city i plainly can see the houses and courtyards and in the gable methinks i can number its panes is a window what thou seest the modest youth thereupon made her answer what thou seest is our dwelling to which i am leading thee downward and that window yonder belongs to my room in the attic which will be thine perhaps for various changes are making all these fields too are ours they are ripe for the harvest to-morrow here in the shade we will rest and partake of our noontide refreshment but it is time we began our descent through the vineyard and garden for dost thou mark how yon threatening storm-cloud comes nearer and nearer charged with lightning and ready our fair full moon to extinguish so they arose from their seats and over the cornfields descended through the luxuriant grain enjoying the brightness of evening until they came to the vineyard and so entered into its shadow then he guided her down o'er the numerous blocks that were lying rough and unhewn on the pathway and served as the steps of the alley slowly the maiden descended and leaning her hands on his shoulder while with uncertain beams the moon through the leaves overlooked them ere she was veiled by the cloud and so left the couple in darkness carefully herman's strength supported the maid that hung o'er him but not knowing the path and the rough-hewn steps that led down it missed she her footing her ankle turned and she surely had fallen had not a dexterous youth his arm outstretched in an instant and his beloved upheld she gently sank on his shoulder breast was pressed against breast and cheek against cheek thus he stood there fixed as a marble statue the force of will keeping him steadfast drew her not to him more closely but braced himself under her pressure thus he the glorious burden felt the warmth of her bosom and the perfume of her breath that over his lips was exhaling bore with the heart of a man the majestic form of the woman but she with playfulness said concealing the pain that she suffered that is a sign of misfortune so timorous person would tell us when on approaching a house we stumble not far from the threshold and for myself i confess i could wish for a happier omen let us here linger a while that thy parents may not have to blame thee seeing a limping maid and thou seem an incompetent landlord End of chapter 8chapter nine of herman and dorothea by johann wolfgang von goethe translated by ellen frothingham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phone urania prospect muses o ye who the course of true love so willingly favour ye who thus far on his way the excellent youth have conducted even before the betrothal have pressed to his bosom the maiden further your aid vouchsafe this charming pair in uniting straightway dispersing the clouds which over their happiness lower yet first of all declare what is passing meanwhile at the lion now for the third time again the mother impatient had entered where were assembled the men whom anxious but now she had quitted spoke of the gathering storm and the moonlight's rapid obscuring then of her son's late tarrying abroad and the dangers of nightfall sharply upbraided her friends that without having speech of the maiden and without urging his suit they had parted from herman so early make it not worse than it is the father replied with displeasure for as thou seest we tarry ourselves and are waiting the issue calmly however from where he was sitting the neighbour made answer never in hours of disquiet like this do i fail to be grateful unto my late blessed father who every root of impatience tore from my heart when a child and left no fibre remaining so that i learned on the instant to wait as do none of your sages tell us the pastor returned what led your domain he made use of that i will gladly relate for all may draw from it a lesson so made the neighbour reply 
when a boy i once stood of a sunday full of impatience and looking with eagerness out for the carriage which was to carry us forth to the spring that lies under the lindens still the coach came not i ran like a weasel now hither now thither upstairs and down and forward and back twixt the door and the window even my fingers itched to be moving i scratched on the tables went about pounding and stamping and hardly could keep me from weeping all was observed by the calm-tempered man but at last when my folly came to be carried too far by the arm he quietly took me led me away to the window and spoke in this serious language seest thou yonder the carpenter's shop that is closed for the sunday he will reopen to-morrow when plane and saw will be started and will keep on through the hours of labour from morning till evening but consider you this a day will be presently coming when that man shall himself be astir and all of his workmen making a coffin for thee to be quickly and skilfully finished then that house of boards they will busily bring over hither which must at last perceive alike the impatient and patient and which is destined soon with close pressing roof to be covered straightway i saw the whole thing in my mind as if it were doing saw the boards fitting together and saw the black colour preparing sat me down patiently then and in quiet awaited the carriage now when others i see in seasons of anxious expectance running distracted about i cannot but think of the coffin smiling the pastor replied the affecting picture of death stands not as a dread to the wise and not as an end to the pious those it presses again into life and teaches to use it these by affliction it strengthens in hope to future salvation death becomes life unto both thy father was greatly mistaken when to a sensitive boy he death in death does depict it let us the value of nobly ripe age point out to the young man and to the age of the youth that in the eternal progression both may rejoice and life may in life thus find its completion but the door was now opened and showed the majestical couple filled with amaze were the friends and amazed the affectionate parents seeing the form of the maid so well matched with that of her lover yea the door seemed too low to allow the tall figures to enter as they together now appeared coming over the threshold herman with hurried words presented her thus to his parents here is a maiden he said such a one as ye wish in the household kindly receive her dear father she merits it well and thou mother question her straightway on all that belongs to a housekeeper's duty that ye may see how well she deserves to ye both to be nearer quickly he then drew aside the excellent clergyman saying help me o worthy sir and speedily out of this trouble loosen i pray thee this knot at whose untying i tremble know that tis not as a lover that i have brought hither the maiden but she believes that as servant she comes to the house and i tremble lest in displeasure she fly as soon as there's mention of marriage but be it straightway decided for she no longer in error thus shall be left and i this suspense no longer can suffer hasten and show us in this a proof of the wisdom we honour towards the company then the clergyman instantly turned him but already alas had the soul of the maiden been troubled hearing the father's speech for he in a sociable fashion had in these playful words with the kindest intention addressed her ay this is well my child with the light i perceive that my herman has the good taste of his father who often showed his in his young days leading out always the fairest to dance and bringing the fairest finally home as his wife our dear little mother here that was for by the bride that a man shall elect we can judge what himself is tell what the spirit is in him and whether he feel his own value nor didst thou need for thyself i'll engage much time for decision for in good sooth methinks he is no difficult person to follow herman had heard but in part his limbs were inwardly trembling and of a sudden a stillness had fallen on all of the circle but by these words of derision for such she could not but deem them 
wounded and stung to the depths of her soul the excellent maiden stood while the fugitive blood o'er her cheeks and e'en to her bosom poured its flush but she governed herself and her courage collecting answered the old man thus her pain not wholly concealing truly for such a reception thy son had in no wise prepared me when he the ways of his father described the excellent burgher thou art a man of culture i know before whom i am standing dealest with every one wisely according as suits his position but thou hast scanty compassion it seems on one such as i am who a poor girl am now crossing thy threshold with purpose to serve thee else with such bitter derision thou wouldst not have made me remember how far removed my fortune from that of thyself and thy son is true i come poor to thy house and bring with me naught but my bundle here where is every abundance to gladden the prosperous inmates yet i know well myself i feel the relations between us say is it noble with so much of mockery straightway to greet me that i am sent from the house while my foot is scarce yet on the threshold anxiously herman turned and signed to his ally the pastor that he should rush to the rescue and straightway dispel the delusion then stepped the wise man hastily forward and looked on the maiden's tearful eyes her silent pain and repressed indignation and in his heart was impelled not at once to clear up the confusion rather to put to the test the girl's disquieted spirit therefore he unto her said in language intended to try her surely thou foreign-born maiden thou didst not maturely consider when thou too rashly decidedst to enter the service of strangers all that is meant by the placing thyself neath the rule of a master for by our hand to a bargain the faith of the year is determined and but a single yea compels to much patient endurance not the worst part of the service the wearisome steps to be taken neither the bitter sweet of a labour that presses unceasing since the industrious freeman must toil as well as the servant but tis to bear with the master's caprice when he censures unjustly or when at variance with self he orders now this now the other bear with the petulance too of the mistress easily angered and with the rude overbearing ways of unmannerly children all this is hard to endure and yet to go on with thy duties quickly without delay nor thyself grow sullen and stubborn yet thou appearest ill-fitted for this since already so deeply stung by the father's jests whereas there is nothing more common than for a girl to be teased on account of a youth she may fancy thus he spoke the maiden had felt the full force of his language and she restrained her no more but with passionate outburst her feelings made themselves weigh a sob broke forth from her now heaving bosom and while the scalding tears poured down she straightway made answer ah that rational man who thinks to advise us in sorrow knows not how little of power his cold words have in relieving ever a heart from that woe which his sovereign fate has inflicted ye are prosperous and glad how then should a pleasantry wound you yet but the lightest touch is a source of pain to the sick man nay concealment itself if successful had profited nothing better show now what had later increased to a bitterer anguish and to an inward consuming despair might perhaps have reduced me let me go back for here in this house i can tarry no longer i will away and wander in search of my hapless companions whom i forsook in their need for myself alone choosing the better this is my firm resolve and i therefore may make a confession which might for years perhaps have else lain hid in my bosom deeply indeed was i hurt by the father's words of derision not that i am sensitive proud beyond what is fitting a servant but that my heart in truth had felt itself stirred with affection towards the youth who to-day had appeared to my eyes as a saviour when he first left me there on the road he still remained present haunting my every thought i fancied the fortunate maiden whom as a bride perhaps his heart had already elected when at the fountain i met him again the sight of him wakened pleasure as great as if there had met me an angel from heaven 
and with what gladness i followed when asked to come as his servant true that i flattered myself in my heart i will not deny it while we were hitherward coming i might peradventure deserve him should i become at last the important stay of the household now i alas for the first time see what risk i was running when i would make my home so near to the secretly loved one now for the first time feel how far removed a poor maiden is from an opulent youth no matter how great her deserving all this i now confess that my heart ye may not misinterpret in that twas hurt by a chance to which i owe my awaking hiding my secret desires this dread had been ever before me that at some early day he would bring him a bride to his dwelling and ah uh, how could i then my inward anguish have suffered happily i have been warned and happily now has my bosom been of its secret relieved while yet there is cure for the evil but no more i have spoken and now shall nothing detain me longer here in a house where i stay but in shame and confusion freely confessing my love and that foolish hope that i cherished not the night which abroad is covered with lowering storm clouds not the roll of the thunder i hear its peal shall deter me not the pelt of the rain which without is beating in fury neither the blustering tempest for all these things have i suffered during our sorrowful flight and while the near foe was pursuing now i again go forth as i have so long been accustomed carried away by the whirl of the times and from everything parted fare ye well i tarry no longer all now is over thus she spoke and back to the door she hastily turned her still bearing under her arm as she with her had brought it her bundle but with both of her arms the mother seized hold of the maiden clasping her round the waist and exclaiming amazed and bewildered tell me what means all this and these idle tears say what mean they i will not let thee depart thou art the betrothed of my herman but still the father stood observing the scene with displeasure looked on the weeping girl and said in a tone of vexation this then must be the return that i get for all my indulgence that at the close of the day this most irksome of all things should happen for there is naught i can tolerate less than womanish weeping violent outcries which only involve in disorder and passion what with a little of sense had been more smoothly adjusted settle the thing for yourselves i am going to bed i have no patience longer to be a spectator of these your marvellous doings quickly he turned as he spoke and hastened to go to the chamber where he was wanted to rest and his marriage bed was kept standing but he was held by his son who said in a tone of entreaty father hasten not from us and be thou not wroth with the maiden i only i am to blame as the cause of all this confusion which by his dissimulation our friend unexpectedly heightened speak o worthy sir for to thee my cause i entrusted heap not up sorrow and anger but rather let all this be ended for i could hold thee never again in such high estimation if thou should show but delight in pain not superior wisdom thereupon answered and said the excellent clergyman smiling tell me what other device could have drawn this charming confession out of the good maiden's lips and thus have revealed her affection has not thy trouble been straightway transformed into gladness and rapture therefore speak up for thyself what need of the tongue of another thereupon herman came forward and spoke in these words of affection do not repent of thy tears nor repent of these passing distresses for they complete my joy and may i not hope it thine also not to engage the stranger the excellent maid as a servant unto the fountain i came but to sue for thy love i came thither only alas my timorous look could thy heart's inclination nowise perceive i read in thine eyes of nothing but kindness as from the fountain's tranquil mirror thou gavest me greeting might i but bring thee home the half of my joy was accomplished but thou completest it unto me now o oh, blessed be thou for it then with a deep emotion the maiden gazed on the stripling 
neither forbade she embrace and kiss the summit of rapture when to a loving pair they come as the longed-for assurance pledge of a lifetime of bliss that appears to them now never ending and to the others meanwhile the pastor had made explanation but with feeling and grace the maid now advanced to the father bent her before him and kissing the hand he would fain have withholden said thou wilt surely be just and forgive one so startled as i was first for my tears of distress and now for the tears of my gladness that emotion forgive me and oh forgive me this also for i can scarce comprehend the happiness newly vouchsafed me yes let that first vexation of which i bewildered was guilty be to the last whatever the maid of affectionate service faithfully promised shall be to thee now performed by the daughter straightway then concealing his tears the father embraced her cordially too the mother came forward and kissed her with fervour pressing her hands in her own the weeping women were silent thereupon quickly he seized the good and intelligent pastor first the father's hand and the wedding ring drew from his finger not so easily either the finger was plump and detained it next took the mother's ring also and with them betrothed he the children saying these golden circlets once more their office performing firmly a tie shall unite which in all things shall equal the old one deeply is this young man imbued with love of the maiden and as the maiden confesses her heart is gone out to him also here do i therefore betroth you and bless for the years that are coming with the consent of the parents and having this friend as a witness then the neighbour saluted at once and expressed his good wishes but when the clergyman now the golden circlet was drawing over the maiden's hand he observed with amazement the other which had already by herman been anxiously marked at the fountain and with a kindly raillery thus thereupon he addressed her so then thy second betrothal is this let us hope the first bridegroom may not appear at the altar and so prohibit the marriage but she answering said oh let me to this recollection yet one moment devote for so much is due the good giver him who bestowed it at parting and never came back to his kindred all that should come he foresaw when in haste the passion for freedom when a desire in the newly changed order of things to be working urged him onward to paris where chains and death he encountered fare thee well were his words i go for all is in motion now for a time on the earth and everything seems to be parting e'en in the firmest states fundamental laws are dissolving property falls away from the hand of the ancient possessor friend is parted from friend and so parts lover from lover here i leave thee and where i shall find thee again or if ever who can tell perhaps these words are our last ones together man's but a stranger here on the earth we are told and with reason and we are each of us now become more of strangers than ever ours no more is the soil and our treasures are all of them changing silver and gold are melting away from their time-honoured patterns all is in motion as though the already shaped world into chaos meant to resolve itself backward into night and to shape itself over mine thou wilt keep thine heart and should we be ever united over the ruins of earth it will be as newly made creatures beings transformed and free no longer dependent on fortune for can aught fetter the man who has lived through days such as these are but if it is not to be that these dangers happily over ever again we be granted the bliss of mutual embraces oh then before thy thoughts so keep my hovering image that with unshaken mind thou be ready for good or for evil should new ties allure thee again and a new habitation enter with gratitude into the joys that fate shall prepare thee love those purely who love thee be grateful to them who show kindness but thine uncertain foot should yet be planted but lightly for there is lurking the twofold pain of a new separation blessings attend thy life but value existence no higher than thine other possessions and all possessions are cheating thus spoke the noble youth and never again i beheld him meanwhile i lost my all and a thousand times thought of his warning 
here too i think of his words when love is sweetly preparing happiness for me anew and glorious hopes are reviving oh forgive me excellent friend that e'en while i hold thee close to my side i tremble so unto the late landed sailor seem the most solid foundations of firmest earth to be rocking thus she spoke and placed the two rings on her finger together but her lover replied with a noble and manly emotion so much the firmer then amid these universal convulsions be dorothea our union we too will hold fast and continue firmly maintaining ourselves and the right to our ample possessions for that man who when times are uncertain is faltering in spirit only increases the evil and further and further transmits it while he refashions the world who keeps himself steadfastly minded poorly becomes it the german to give to these fearful excitements aught of continuance or to be this way and that way inclining this is our own let that be our word and let us maintain it for to those resolute peoples respect will be ever accorded for who god and the laws for parents women and children fought and died as together they stood with their front to the foeman thou art mine own and now what is mine is mine more than ever not with anxiety will i preserve it and trembling enjoyment rather with courage and strength to-day should the enemy threaten or in the future equip me thyself and hand me my weapons let me but know that under thy care are my house and dear parents oh i can then with assurance expose my breast to the foeman and where but every man minded like me there would be an upspring might against might and peace should revisit us all with its gladness end of chapter nine recording by phone end of herman and dorothea by johann wolfgang von goethe translated by ellen frothingham